thank God for the word. So Psalm 107, Psalm 107, uh, verse 20, just came up in my spirit. It just came up by the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to read it to you uh, because there is a principle here in this small psalm that applies to every area of life. Psalm 107, 20 says, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. How did God heal us? How, what, what means does God use? What method does God use to set us free? What, does, what method does God use to deliver us from our destructions, our own self-inflicted destructions? He sent his word. Well, we know, number one, that Jesus is his word. So he sent Jesus, obviously, to deliver us through his substitutionary work on the cross. Yeah, that's true. But there's another meaning here. He sent his word, his gospel, his word, and healed us and delivered us from our destruction. So when you are facing situations in life, whatever they might be, destruction, even self-inflicted, caused by ourselves, caused by you, whatever that may be, whatever the situation, God's cure, God's solution is his word. So put his word first so that he can, through his word, deliver you. You know, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, uh, the Holy Spirit said there through the apostle Paul, he said, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. So, so faith comes. That means that you don't have this kind, God kind of faith. You don't have it inherently in you as a human. You don't have this, this kind of faith that activates the power of God, the kind of faith that moves mountains, that works miracles, which is what we need. We need supernatural happening in our natural life. See, you have to understand a lot of things that are happening in your life right now are not natural. They're supernatural. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, mights, and dominions, and rulers of darkness, all right, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Our, our battle, our wrestling is not with people. It's not with flesh and blood. That's not where you should be wrestling. You're wrestling the wrong thing. It's the spirits behind it. It's the influence behind it, the influencers in the unseen realm of principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. That's Ephesians 6. I think it's Ephesians, I think it's Ephesians 6, 12. My point is, is you can't fight supernat- a supernatural battle with natural human confidence, natural human confidence. So when he says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes then apparent by, by hearing and hearing by the word of God, there is a kind of faith that must come. It's not in you inherently. It comes by hearing the word. Now, once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, once you've heard the gospel and you respond to the gospel and you accept Jesus and God imparts his righteous nature into your spirit, God imparts his presence God imparts himself into your spirit. He also, when you're born again, imparts his faith. So now that you've heard faith came by hearing, you now have the faith of God. You now have the supernatural, supernatural equipment to deal with the supernatural events in your life. Hallelujah. Man, this is powerful. So you're not trying to fight a natural, a supernatural battle with with natural human faith. There is a natural human faith, just a natural confidence. But there's also a 
divine faith, a God kind of faith. And that kind of faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. One translation says, hearing the message of Christ, the gospel. Now, once you've heard and once you've accepted Jesus, you have the faith of God in you. It's resident in there, waiting for it to be activated. You activate this faith of God through word, through the word you speak and actions, and you've got to be convinced of it. You need to act on it. You need to know that you, see, see, it, 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 God's power is available. God's power, God's ability is available. Now, we have the authority, because we're in Christ, we have the authority to use God's power. We have the authority to release God's power into whatever situations that we're dealing with. In other words, the authority is the switch or that turns on the power. The power is God's, and the authority is ours. He gave it to us. So when we speak the word, when we decree things, when we declare things, when we speak things, when we say things that line up with the word of God, that line up with the new covenant, and, and we say it in the name of Jesus, we are literally flipping the switch that releases the power of God into the situation. You're able to bless things that appear to be cursed. You bless it. You bless your husband. You bless your children. You bless your wife. You bl- I bless them. I declare blessing over them. They're blessed and not cursed. They're free and not bound. They're the head and they're not the tail. They're above and they're not beneath. And you declare the word of God. You take things like by his stripes we were healed. That belongs to you. You can say that over yourself. Thank God by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. And because I was, I am healed. Man, that 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 ignites the power of God. That gives the power of God traction. It gives the power of God something to work with. See, you have the authority to activate God's power. And the way you do it is to agree with the word of God and verbally, not just mentally, verbally speak it. Get busy speaking it. There's a man, and one of our elders uh, on our board of directors in our church who has been struggling with his legs for a number of years, and we've prayed and we've laid hands on him, and we've seen some improvement, but not as much as we would like to see. And uh, the other day, I saw him walking across the gymnasium. I mean, walking. And he came over and was chatting with me and sat down, and and I didn't notice till he pointed it out. He said, you notice that I came in here without my cane, without a, not mine, he didn't say mine, without a cane? I said, no, I didn't notice. He said, did you notice that now? Do you notice? I said, man, and you were, hard, you were hardly limping. He said, that's right. He said, I got a hold of a book by Charles Caps. Remember that back in the day? I said, yeah, I remember that book. It was um, how to speak. It was all the scriptures compiled in a book with a confession that you would speak. And so he said, I have been daily, more than once a day, taking those scriptures on healing and declaring them to be true in my life. Going through them, he sent his word and healed me. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Jesus took my infirmities and he bore my sicknesses. I'm strong and my knees are strong in the Lord. My legs are strong in the Lord. My legs function the way they're supposed to function. My knees function. Arthritis, get out of my legs. Get out of my body. Knees, you're functioning. He said, I've been doing that daily, multiple times. He said, I've been doing it for a number of weeks now, several weeks. And he said, did you notice I came in here without my without the cane? I said, I've noticed that. He said, it's working. This word is working. See, a lot of times if we're not careful, we, we, relegate, we relegate all healing under the heading of laying on of hands. Well, that's the only way to get healed is to go have hands laid on me or whatever. But I'm telling you, the Bible says he sent his word and healed us. Put this word of God first. Put the word of God first. Now, here's Hebrews 
uh, chapter three. I'm I'm out here flying by the seat of my pants now. I'm fly. I am totally out here. I don't know where I'm going to go next. If the Lord doesn't show me, jumpstart nation. I don't know where we're headed. So we're going to Ephesians or Hebrews three. Therefore, three one. Therefore, holy brethren. Therefore, holy brethren. Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Notice that Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession. We could say profession, what we profess, what we speak. Jesus is the apostle and high priest of the words of our mouth. In the Old Covenant, the high priest would offer a dead sacrifice of an animal, a a goat, a sheep, a a, a pigeon, a turtle dove, um, an ox, a goat. But in the New Covenant, he offers up our words, our high priest, the Lord Jesus. The sacrifices that now uh, come before the altar are the words that we speak, and he processes those words and they ascend, and they produce the results they're supposed to produce. When uh, when uh, when a, a leper in the old covenant would would uh, come to the priest with two turtle doves, they would examine him, and they would sacrifice the two birds, and the one would die, and the other one be set free, and they would declare that the leper was cleansed. And this is amazing, praise God. So I'm going to say this to you. Uh, The word heals. He sent his word and healed you. Reading the word will heal you. Meditating on the word will heal you. Speaking the word will heal you. It, it, it It will release angelic activity. It will bind satanic and demonic activity. Speaking the word is powerful. So I want to remind you of something that Rhea said yesterday Go, you know, take time every day to read one proverb a day. Take time. That was her assignment to read one proverb a day. And I personally like the book of Proverbs in the NLT, the New Living Translation. It's just something about the New Living Translation and the book of Proverbs. It just, I don't know, man. It just made sense. The King James is a little blurry to me, but man, the New Living Translation. So, the, the assignment Rhea gave, the encouragement she gave was read a proverb a day. You know, it's 31 of them, so you could read through the book of Proverbs once a month by taking five or so minutes and read one chapter of Proverbs per day. It'll breed wisdom in you. It'll, it'll birth wisdom in your heart and mind. It's the living word of God. It is the almighty word of God. Amen. Praise God. And then, but notice this, Jesus is the apostle and high priest of your confession, your profession. He was sent for your words. When you speak the word of God, when you confess the word of God, as we do every day here, Monday through Friday, it is activating his uh, apostolic anointing, his high priestly function. Praise God. Say this out loud. Jesus is the apostle. And the high priest of my confession, of my words, when I speak the word of God out of my mouth, Jesus is activated in his ministry. That's awesome. Now notice, so so heaven is activated by that, right? Right? That's where Jesus is. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed into the or passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Hold fast to your words. Speak the word. Hold fast to the word you speak. Speak the word of God. Declare what is true. Don't keep talking about the circumstance. Don't keep talking and empowering that. See, what you speak empowers what you say. Uh, If you keep talking about how big the problem is, well, then that's what's happening. If you keep talking about 
how little you have of strength or how helpless you are or how frustrated you are or how weak you are or how you don't know what to do. You are absolutely activating those things. Turn that around, man. The temptation is to speak only what you know about in the natural, but move into the supernatural. And in spite of what you see with your eyes and hear with your ears and know with your natural intellect, speak the word of God. Get you four or five scriptures that pertain to your situation. Get you four or five scriptures that deal with your situation and begin to declare them to be true in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen, Char. That's exactly true. Our understanding does increase. In fact, faith's confessions, Char, create realities. And I like what Nancy said about the book of Proverbs. The Lord is very serious about this teaching in Proverbs right now. The Holy Spirit and had me challenge our women's Bible study and our church body on Wednesday night to do the same thing. We need his wisdom. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And one of the first things he's going to do is tell you to read the book of Proverbs. I'm telling you, in, in fact, uh, look at James. I, I just, there's some things here. Again, I'm, I, we're, just, we're just being random, but it's a spirit-led randomness. Notice James chapter 1, verse 2. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, various tests. What does God want you to do when you're facing severe tests and afflictions and testing and trial? What does he say? My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Whew, that's a tall order. It's only a tall order, though, if we don't understand the rest of the verses. See, it doesn't end there. But it didn't say it is joy. He said count it. it that's an accounting term. Account it as joy. Why? Why? See, if you understand the why, then you'll know you can do this because there's a reason why. So why should we count it all joy? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Okay, patience. All right, so the testing of, notice, notice this is not the testing of your character or the testing of your righteousness. It's the testing of your confidence in God. Your, your faith in the word is being tested. All right. So knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Well, what's that have to do with anything? Why does that mean not? Why would that lead me to count what I'm going through as joy? Well, but notice what he says, but Verse three, but verse four, let patience have her perfect, its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let patience have its perfect work. When you're under the, the temptation and test of the devil and of, of life and you're facing a trial and it's a, it's, it's, it's pressure and you're feeling, you're being afflicted, count it all joy knowing that the testing of your faith in God will produce patience. And when you let patience have its complete work, you will come out of this situation perfect, uh, that you may be perfect. That means complete. What was missing in your, in your character, what was missing in your belief system, what was missing in your perspective, what was missing in your attitude, what was missing in your life, in your heart, will be complete. You'll be complete, perfect. That means uh, mature. And watch, lacking nothing. God doesn't want you to lack any good thing. Is He's on your side. He's for you. He's not against you. Count it all joy, knowing when I come out on the other side of this, I'm coming out mature, I'm coming out complete, and I'm coming out of this situation lacking nothing that's from God, nothing good, powerful, powerful. Say this out loud, I make the decision right now to count it all joy when I fall into various tests. I, because I know that the testing of my faith 
produces patience. I'm letting patience have its perfect work. Therefore, I am mature and complete and lacking nothing. Did you hear that? As you allow patience to have its perfect work in the midst of whatever tests and trials we go through, as you count it all joy, because you're going to wind up better afterwards than you did before. In other words, the devil picked on the wrong person. It made me better, not bitter. I'm coming out a champion. You know, the Lord said this to me the other day. I was just contemplating things as I was working. He said, I can do the same thing for you that I did for Job. In fact, he said to me, by this piece, in fact, that begins right now. What did he do for Job? I mean, Job made all kinds of mistakes. He had all kinds. His attitude was wrong. He's full of pride. He was unteachable. He was stubborn as a mule. He was self-righteous, self-congratulating. Oh, my gosh. He smelled of, he reeked of self-righteousness, self-sufficiency, self-trust. He trusted himself. He trusted his schooling. He trusted his, He trusted his wisdom. He's all the time bragging about, in fact, at one point in Job, he said, if I could just meet God face to face, I would set him straight and I would win my argument. That He had the nerve to say that. Man, talk about pride. Well, finally, at the end of this, he finally, he, Job finally ends up at the end of this nine months is all it was. I mean, at the end of nine months, he finally says, God, I have been so ignorant. It has been wrong, man. I've been so wrong on so many counts. And I, I just repent uh, of all that uh, I've been saying. Uh, I Because he finally had a vision of God where God demonstrated who he was. Let me read this to you. Praise God. Um, verse 40, moreover, the, the Lord, this is at the end of it. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, shall the one who contends with the almighty correct him? He said, you are contending with the almighty and you presume to correct me. Job was trying to correct God. He who rebukes God, let him answer it. He said, how dare you rebuke me? I'm God. I know better. I am the one that made you, Job. And then finally, Job said in uh, uh, Job 40, verse 3, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? He said, I lay my hand over my mouth. You know, some of us need to be brought to, brought to the place where we, we lay our hand over our mouth. We're just too quick to shoot off answers. It's really, it's really pride. We, we've always want our voice to be heard. We've always got to get our two cents in. We've always got to sort of demonstrate what we know. And so Job, he finally said, I, I'm laying my hand over my mouth. He said, once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. He said, Lord, I, you, I'm shutting my mouth. I have been speaking ignorantly. And then the Lord answered Job in a, out of a whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. He said, You've been questioning me. Now I'm going to question you. And then in verse 8, he said, Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? He's saying, Job, are you condemning me? Are you finding me at fault so you can justify yourself? Are you blaming me for your problems so that you can be justified that you're, you've not done anything wrong? Dude, this is serious stuff, man. This is powerful. But now we get over to verse 32, 42, the last chapter of Job. And Job finally says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Job has finally humbled himself. Therefore, he said, I've uttered what I don't understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. 
Then in verse 5, he says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know, there's a place where you need to come to where you really abhor yourself. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. You need to come to the place where you know you're not all that. You, you're, you're not all that. You need to come to the, yourself where your pride is dealt with, where God is able to reduce you to God. I'm shutting my mouth. I'm not trusting in my ability. I am nothing without you. I am nothing. See, God's trying to bring us to this place of reverence and humility. He really is. You gotta, you've got to stop trying to be strong and self-righteous. Job was so cocky, he was actually questioning and challenging God and justifying himself. And he said, I've heard you. See, Job said, I've heard you secondhand. I've heard about you by the hearing of the ear. I've heard what others have said about you. And that's half our problem is we've heard what others have said about God, but we don't have a personal relationship ourselves. And so we're operating on secondhand information. We got brother so-and-so CDs and sister so-and-so's MP3s. And we've got that one's MP. I've heard that. I've read that book. But we haven't developed a humble, intimate relationship where we fall upon the mercy of God, fall upon the grace of God and say, God, I'm nothing without you, but I'm not without you, so I'm not nothing. I'm, I'm, Christ is in me, the hope of glory. I have Christ in me. But if Christ wasn't in me, I would not be doing well. See, that's a place you got to come to. He said, but now my eyes sees you. He said, now I've, I'm seeing you with my own eyes. I've got direct revelation. So, Father, grant us revelation in Jesus' name. Grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Amen. See, if you have an answer for everything, there's a pride issue. If you've always got to put in your two cents, give your opinion, your voice always has to be heard, there's a pride issue. And God loves you, and he wants to deal with that so he can really do what he really wants to do in your life. He longs to bless you. He longs to see you fully blessed. But he couldn't do it the way it was happening. Man. But God is so good and so patient. He'll continue to work with us. Praise God. Amen. Now, but here's what the Lord did. So after Moses or after Job repented from all of this, um, first thing God says to Job, he said, now that you've repented, pray for your friends because they gave you horrible advice, which means they're in the dark. Pray for your friends. And then watch this. Um, and the Lord, verse 10, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he had prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, I want to read this again. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. You see, Job stopped acting like he was the sharpest knife in the drawer. He stopped acting like he was the biggest and the baddest because that's what he thought. He said, Job, I want you to humble yourself and pray. Pray for your friends. Who do you need to pray for? Are you still trying to figure it out? Are you still worrying and fretting? Are you still losing sleep at night? Pray. Pray for them. You know why? Because you finally understand God is able. God is able. No more excuses. I'm not going to listen to any more excuses. I'm not going to justify anything. I'm not going to try to figure it out. God, I thank you. You know, if it's a fellow believer, pray for the Ephesians 1. Pray, pray Ephesians 1. Father, grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Flood the eyes of their heart with light. That's Ephesians 1. Ephesians 3. Father, grant them to be strengthened by your spirit in their inner man, that Christ will dwell in their heart by faith. I'm telling you, when you come to that place of dependency on God, it's a power play. It's a place of power. 
but you've rested in the Lord. You're not trusting your own skills, your own abilities, your own resources, totally trusting God. Man, that's the place of peace and rest and humility and submission. It is powerful when the Lord begins to work that into your heart and life. Praise God. But notice what God did. With all the foolish pride that Job had, he didn't deserve anything. He repents. And what does God do? God restores his losses, but he doesn't just restore it. He gives him twice as much as he had before. And that's what the Holy Spirit said to me, Byron, I can do for you what I did for Job. Uh, Here's what was happening. I was thinking back over several decades of some really bad decisions I've made. I made some good ones too, but I made some really bad ones. And I hear I'm thinking about, I, don't, I can't go back. I can't, re, I can't rewind the clock. I can't redo this. I can't redo that. And then the enemy's chiming in on me. You know, if you'd have done that differently, if you'd have done this differently, and the condemnation's coming, boy, shame on you. And I heard the Lord say, Byron, I can do the same thing for you that I did for Job. And in a matter of a split second, I can restore double what you lost through your bad choices because Job made horrible choices. So I want you to say out loud, as I humble myself under the mighty hand of God, the Lord is doing for me what he did for Job. He is restoring the things I've lost, the opportunities I've lost, the relationships I've lost because of my horrible decisions. God is doing for me what he did for Job because I am now praying for others. I'm praying, not worrying. I'm trusting, not stressing. And the Lord is giving to me twice as much as I had before. Now, some some may have heard the thought, you may have thought, well, I don't I don't care about that. I don't need twice as much money or twice as many cars or okay. But there's but he's not just talking about money. He lost his daughters. He lost his daughters-in-law. He lost his sons. He lost a lot of relationships, lost time. But God restored those relationships. So maybe it's not money, but I'll take the money too. If God wants to restore double the houses, double the cars, come on, come on, God, bring it. But he's also talking about restoring relationships. God can do for you what he did for Job. I heard him whisper that in my mind. And you know what? I don't know about you, but I'm going to declare this. God is doing for me what he did for Job. As I pray for others, as I pray even for those who think they're my enemies, as I pray for those who have tried to hurt and harm me, God is restoring double. And I am humbly grateful because just like Job, I have made a mess of things. But just like Job, God is bigger than my messes. This is awesome. This is awesome. Amen. So, yeah, this circles back to Proverbs. Holy Spirit is amazing. Yeah, this was totally, totally, totally random. But, man, I'm going to give you one more verse before we go. What time is it? Oh, it's nope, it's too late. It's 940. Man, I was going to take you to James. James tells us to consider the end of Job's life, which is chapter 42. He didn't say consider all the beginning. He said consider the end, how God, what God's intention is. God's intention is for you to walk in the fullness of his blessing. 
paid for by the blood of Jesus. God's not angry with you. He will never be angry with you. He's not in a bad mood. He loves you. He'll never remember your sins ever again. They have been burned up at the cross. You are loved. You are accepted. You are blessed. And God is doing for you what he did for Job, restoring double to you. Say it out loud. I'm in a Job moment. I'm living in a Job 42 season. He sent his word and healed you now. This word was sent by the Spirit of God. I was going to go to Galatians 6 1. We're going to get through Galatians. I am determined. But uh, the Lord wanted to do this. So thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you. Love every one of you. Marilyn, good to see you. Amen. The word is awesome. He sent his word and healed you. Go back and listen to this again and again and again. Get it into your mind. Let it sink down into your hearing. Let it sink down into your heart. And don't forget to read Psalms. Uh, not Psalms. One proverb a day. New Living Translation is awesome. Char, we will get through Galatians. Love you guys. Have an awesome rest of your day. And we will see you either online Sunday or Monday at Nine. Thank all of you for your financial support. Many of you are supporting us monthly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Blessings are yours. Thank you for your support. See you Monday morning.